Good morning. There's still good seats over here down front, so <laughs> welcome to worship. We're glad that you're here with us today, and we're glad that you're worshiping online as well. If you're visiting, please sign our guest book with your address so we have a way to be in touch with you. Just a few announcements today. The altar flowers are given by Jenny and Bill Merritt in honor of Alexandria's birthday, so we congratulate her on her birthday. Um, youth group today, 2 to 4 at the Adrian Skatery. So if you want to come watch Damage or whatever, you know, <laughs> that's the time, 2 to 4 today. Um, before we start with our prelude, Jean has an announcement about flags. Where's Jean? There we go. <laughs> How much are the flags each? One flag, 35 per flag. Okay, cool. And we try to have seven or eight on our corner out there, so thank you. Prepare your hearts for worship as we hear our prelude.
We rise for the thanksgiving for baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the wellspring of grace, our Easter and our joy. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. Immersed in the promises of baptism, let us give thanks for what God has done for us. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your voice thundered over the deep, and water became the essence of life. Adam and Eve beheld Eden's verdant rivers. The ark carried your creation through the flood into a new day. Miriam led the dancing as your people passed through the sea into freedom's land. In a desert pool, the Ethiopian official entered your boundless baptismal life. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. At the river, your beloved son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you opened the floodgates of your reconciling love, freeing us to live as Easter people. We rejoice with glad hearts, giving all honor and praise to you through the risen Christ, our source of living water, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Hallelujah. We sing our gathering hymn. Let us pray. O oh God, you give us your Son as the vine, apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in his resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated.
Good morning. morning. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 8. Led by the Spirit, Philip encounters an Ethiopian official who is returning to his African home after having been to Jerusalem to worship. Philip uses their encounter to proclaim the gospel to him. Upon coming to faith in Jesus, he is baptized by Philip. The reading begins. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch said, ask Philip, about whom may I ask does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak and started with his scripture. He proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Ozotus, and he was passing through the region. He proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Please uh, read responsibly, Psalm 22. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. Our second reading is from 1 John 4, verses 7 through 21. We love God and others because God first loved us. We cannot say we love God whom we have not seen while hating fellow Christians whom we regularly see. Love toward God is to be matched by love toward others because the essence of God is love. The reading begins. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. 
There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars, for those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 15th chapter. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Have the children come forward at this time. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. Hey, have you ever planted anything? Yeah, I planted a couple trees. Planted a couple trees? Okay. Well, I found this in my yard. I, I think I could plant it and make a tree out of it. What do you think? No, why not? You need seeds, and it's kind of dead too, isn't it? Kind of brown. When you plant a tree, you can't just plant like the branch unless you really fertilize it a lot, and it might maybe possibly grow. You need to be connected to the tree, right, for it to grow. Jesus told a story about vines and branches, and he said we're kind of like, kind of like that. If we're connected to Jesus, then we're going to grow. We're going to take off. And if we're connected to other people in the vine, we're going to grow even better, right? Okay, let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for being a part of our lives, for calling us to be joined to you as the vine and the branches so that we might grow. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up, guys. Have a good day. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the living Christ. So I'm going to start a rumor this morning. I think, maybe, possibly, that spring has sprung. (laughs) After all, we're supposed to hit 80 today. We are camped over at Indian Creek. We used both our air conditioner and our furnace yesterday. And as we head into May, it's sounding like maybe it's going to moderate, maybe it's going to get warm. But I do know that after living in Michigan for 29 years, which is the longest I've ever lived in one place, things could change. It could snow in May, which makes it tough for us who garden, right? And like to grow things. We've been waiting to start our garden until that frost is gone so we can put things in. Our gospel for this fifth week of Easter deals with themes of growth and new life. And John captures this wonderfully poetic image that Christ uses to describe our new life in Jesus as vines and branches. And using that imagery, Jesus employs an example that would be very familiar to his audience, to the Israelites. Throughout the Old Testament, the children of Israel often were described as a vine or a vineyard, although usually in a negative sense. 
Allegorically speaking, often the Israelites were the unruly vines, the ones that had to be cut off, and that if they went, they would ruin the vineyard, and they had to be destroyed. So this is most likely the background Jesus is building on as he refers to himself as the true vine. And he was implying that it's not enough to just rest in the fact that we're part of the vine by virtue of our roots or our tradition or our connections. In fact, Jesus is proposing a radical new concept that we need to be regrafted, cut again into the vine. And Jesus would be the one who would have that connection for us to God. Jesus' Jewish listeners knew that a vineyard took a great deal of care if it was to be fruitful. Vineyards produce two types of branches, one that bears fruit and one that does not. The ones that do not must be pruned back and literally not suck the life out of the vines that are fruitful. We gardeners know that vineyards and plants require a great deal of pruning, right? Before they can be fruitful. When I was in college and seminary, I was on my own. My family could not help me with my expenses, so I often held down an on-campus job and at least one or two off-campus jobs. My favorite job was working for a family by the name of Carlisle, Bill and Mary. Mr. Carlisle was the president of Huntington Bank in Columbus, and Mrs. Carlisle was the keeper of their social calendar and their six children. And they paid me well to do yard work, to clean the house, to run errands, to drop them off at the airport in their Cadillac whenever they traveled. And I enjoyed most of the tasks they gave me except for one, trimming the ivy. Their first house was a massive three-story brick house. It was part of the Underground Railroad that ran through Ohio, and it was surrounded by ivy. Ivy in the flower beds, ivy in the gardens, ivy in the wrought iron fence, ivy that ran up the brick on the side of the house, ivy that busted through a window into a breakfast nook that Mrs. Carlisle thought was just delightful. <laughs> she was a bit eccentric, shall we say, and she just loved the ivy. And I was under strict instructions to never, I repeat, never trim the ivy. Mr. Carlisle was a bit more practical. He wanted to take a flamethrower to the ivy, <laughs> which I wholeheartedly agreed with since it was a dirty, dusty, never-ending task. And those disagreements between Mr. and Mrs. C often worked in my favor. You see, I'd show up on Saturday morning and Mrs. C would give me my task for the day, which included never trim the ivy, never trim the ivy, you're with me. And then Mr. C would take me aside and say, trim the ivy. At the end of the day, I would get my lecture from Mrs. C for trimming the ivy, and then Mr. C would pay me and discreetly slip me a bonus for cutting back some of the ivy. And when I finally got home, Diane's first question to me would be, did you trim any ivy today? <laughs> because that determined if we went out on a date that night. <laughs> and regardless, no matter how much I trim that dirty, dusty, nasty stuff, it always came back again and again and again. No matter how much I hacked it back and burned it and hauled it away, it would come back lush and green. The lesson for us in this reading is that abiding in the vine means that sometimes God allows some drastic cutting or pruning in our lives for new growth. We may not have liked it at the time. We may have complained quite loudly to God. We may have said to God, stop, that's too much. But in each and every one of us has experienced those pruning times, and we have survived. It may have been a time of pain or loss or disappointment. It might have been an unexpected illness, a job that didn't work out, messing up a relationship, a failed plan or dream, a problem child, the death of a friend or loved one. Nobody is excused from going through life without some kind of pruning experience. But here's another interesting aspect of pruning. 
The Greek word for pruning can also be translated as not just cutting off the branches, but also lifting them up from the ground. Bruce Wilkinson in his book, The Secrets of the Vine, says that newer branches tend to grow along the ground where they can be covered in dust and mildew and insects, and they become sickly. So a good caretaker does not saw them off if they look like they're struggling and have not borne fruit. Instead, he lifts them up. He lifts them up and supports them with a trellis. That allows them to get better circulation, more rain, more sunshine, and produce fruit. So the message is that abiding in the vine will sometimes involve some pruning, sometimes some pain, sometimes some struggle. But if we're grafted into Jesus, we belong to him. He is the source of our life and our sustenance. He has profoundly changed us, and he has lifted us. He has lifted us. Our second reading from 1 John described it well, and I want you to hear that reading from the message translation. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son that we might live through him. And this is the kind of love we're talking about. Not that once upon a time God loved, but that he loves us and sent his son to clear our sins and the damage we've done in our relationship with God. If God loves us, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God ever, but if we love one another, God dwells in us and his love becomes complete in us. And God is love. And God takes up permanent residence in a life of love. So this way, love has the run of the house. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating their brother or sister, think nothing of it, they are a liar. That's the strongest language we find in the New Testament. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God who he does not see? Loving God includes loving people. You've got to do both. So this is what abiding in the vine is all about, brothers and sisters. Jesus, the risen one, should be that, the one that takes up permanent residence in our life, the one that has the run of the house in our hearts and helps us to love as much as we say we love God. That's the kind of love that was poured out on the cross. He is still risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.
Please rise as you're able as we confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and those in need of good news. We pray for the church around the world, for all ministers, for all in the mission of the gospel. Keep all the newly baptized and confirmed in your care. Cleanse our hearts with your word and help us to abide in you always. God of grace. For the well-being of the earth and all growing things, for rivers and lakes, for streams and estuaries, for melting glaciers and polluted waters, renew the face of the earth and shower us with your goodness. God of grace. Hear our prayer. For the nations and all those in authority, for local, state, and national leaders, for elected representatives at every level, and for international organizations that justice and peace may reign. God of grace. For all those in need, for any experiencing homelessness or unemployment, for those fleeing from oppression or seeking asylum, for all who are ill or suffering or grieving, especially Rachel, Diane, Fred, Sherry, Gail, Ken, Minerva, Audrey, John, Alice, Gary, Roger, Cheryl, Doug, Wayne, Todd, Rick, Wade, David, Debbie, Brian, Brendan, Bob, Nan, Jim, Donna, and Juliana, Pastor Sarah and Pastor Hank, a confirmation class, Carson and Juliet, Good Shepherd and Lutheran Church of Monroe, licensed lay minister Kathy Maxwell, the family of Dorothy Seats, God of grace. For our congregation, for the caring ministries of this faith community, for all who visit and minister to one another, for all who take communion to homes or care centers, for all who seek to share your love with the world, God of grace. With thanksgiving for the saints who rest from their labors, Help us like them to bear much fruit and to become your disciples, and at the last bring us to that heavenly banquet where all will feast together at your table, God of grace. And your hands, most merciful God, we commend to all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. We share a sign of the peace.
Congregation, please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus, the true Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim. We praise your name and join their unending hymn. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. We feast on God's middle of love for us together. You may be seated.
Congregation, please rise. Let us pray. Shepherd and God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and to share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter, hope, and bless you now and always. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, go in peace, rejoice, and be glad. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Good morning. Good morning.